Hello and very warm greetings. My name is Christopher Sparks and I'm the translator of the Keys of the Kingdom Holy Bible and a very warm welcome to the Keys of the Kingdom Holy Bible YouTube channel, the channel that tells you everything about the Bible they do not want you to know, even about the Lord's Prayer. At the opening of Luke chapter 11, it describes Jesus praying in a certain place and bringing his prayers to a close. And I just thought to myself, I wonder how he did that. But he didn't say in Jesus' name, Amen. Um, and in fact, one of the disciples says to him, teach us to pray as uh, John's disciples taught him to pray. So Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father and so the so follow the words of what we have come to call the lord's prayer now the luke 11 version is slightly shorter than the other occasion where he taught them this in matthew chapter 6 that's a slightly longer version and this is it word for word how it goes um, in the keys of the kingdom organic translation so Matthew 6, starting at verse 9. Our Father in the heavens, may your name be set apart. May your kingdom come, may your will be brought to pass. As in heaven, so also on the earth. Our sufficient bread give us this day, and forgive our offences, as we ourselves in turn forgive our debtors. And bring us not into adversity, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the might and the glory throughout the eons. Amen. Lead us not into adversity, but deliver us from evil. Hey, but hold on. The church system Bibles have not lead us into um, lead us not into adversity, but lead us not into temptation. Hey, eh? But the letter of Jacob, that they insist on calling James for Iacobus, says in Jacob chapter 1 verse 13, God is not tempted by evils, and he himself does not tempt anybody. So why ask him to not lead you into temptation if he doesn't tempt it's an empty prayer, and it's stupid to pray that. So lead us not into temptation is disharmonious. What does it suggest but a pleading of God to not lead us to break his commands that he's constantly trying to make us keep? The very commandments he tells us to keep, this is a prayer that try and plead him with him to not lead us to tempt us to break them and yet they say before that forgive us our trespasses then they say please don't try and make me sin by leading us into temptation oh don't try and make me break your laws you try and make me keep and then when we do break them there's divine displeasure so to ask God to not lead us into temptation is a blasphemy, in fact, of his nature. Because he doesn't lead anybody into temptation. It says so in Jacob chapter 1 verse 13. So you will know that uh, the keys of the kingdom Bible is founded on translating laws. And the first is grammar, and the second is internal harmony. There are others, but I'll just stop there. Internal harmony. It must be all harmonious, because it's divine. But you know, people think that because this translation is old, that it must be right. Um, but it isn't. It's anti-biblical. Uh, what abuse I got on social media last year when somebody put up a question about this. What does it mean in uh, the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation? 
So I raised this, that it's um, a wrong translation because um, James, I condescended <laughs> to use the uh, term uh, name James, uh, says that God tempts nobody. Well, it's a very reasonable thing to say, is it not? Well, apparently not. Somebody called Vladimir something, somebody. I didn't write down the surname. Responded straight away. Up pops this. Swine, you are no brother. You are a pagan apologist. And then, you are clearly lying here. Stay in Matthew and tell us why KJV is wrong. Don't bring up James. Huh, who do you think you are, little boy? So I brought up James again. And then somebody else calling himself Rivers something. If we follow your logic, then maybe James is the one who made the blunder. Eh? Well, that's not logic. My logic is that the translation in Matthew is wrong because it's inconsistent with James 1.13. But he suggests that my, by my logic, James got it wrong. So it's just twisted. And then he said, says, it's so silly um, to dismiss passages of Scripture that you don't like. Well, I didn't dismiss it. I corrected the bad translation. Then he says, I think you're just some kind of nutty cult guy. <laughs> Keyboard warriors, hey? Life is short. You're wasting that little time you have left. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Um, so, I presume they're of the KJV only cult. But it is clearly a conflict of God's nature. I mean, a whole book of um, history, of the patriarchs, the prophets, the apostles, and of Jesus, our Messiah and Savior, teaching us how to obey God's commands, telling us that God doesn't tempt anybody, and then saying, please, God, don't try and make me break your commandments. It's stupid. And so with that word, uh, lead, uh, lead us not into temptation, any enemy or opponent of our book of God could rightly point to its inconsistency and call it hypocritical. Well, they'd be right, wouldn't they? So this lead us not into temptation is chanted up and down the country uh, here in England and Doubtless in uh, every English-speaking country and probably um, many others having this word temptation. Um, day after day by tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. And does anybody really stop and think about what the words are saying? So the Greek word they translate in the King James Bible or the Queen James Bible is um, Pierasmos, and this is Strong's Concordance Reference G3986. If you're not familiar with Strong's Concordance, James Strong put numbers for all the Hebrew and Greek words, and you can buy his concordance um, that is linked with these numbers, and it's also in Wigram's Concordances and um, Thayer's Lexicon. But you can get it online as well. Just type it into a search engine. Strong's G3986. Now this Pierasmos can mean temptation, but not here. For it also means adversity, affliction, disaster, trouble, trial, testing. Bring us not into adversity, affliction, trouble, trial, testing. Yeah, now that makes sense, doesn't it? And deliver us from evil. Deliver us from calamity, disaster, trouble, trial. They actually mean the same thing, even though they're different words. 
The word translated as evil is poneros. Um, incidentally, where we get porn, pornography from. And, but in this context, they mean the same thing. Adversity and evil, calamity and evil, affliction and trouble. Two words and two lines of the prayer expressing the same thing. So evil put for disaster. And how is this? Well, it's by the linguistic device called parallelism. This is where two clauses or phrases or sentences run parallel to each other in their meaning. They're expressed slightly differently, but they mean the identical thing. So one thing expressed two ways. And many of you, I'm sure, will know that biblical poetry is full of this. Psalm 49 verse 1. Hear this, all people. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world. So they mean the same. Hear this, all people, give ear, all inhabitants of the world. So hear this means the same as give ear. And then all people means the same as all inhabitants of the world. Isaiah 45 verse 6. There is no one apart from me. I am Yahweh and there is no one else. They mean the same. And Psalm 78 is full of these parallelisms. And so why does um, biblical poetry use them? Because they're useful for reinforcement of what's being said. And they create a good rhythm. And they're good for memory. So that's why. And so we have these two elements. Lead us not into adversity. That's the negative expression. Don't lead us into adversity, trial, disaster. But deliver us from evil. That's the positive expression. So lead us not negative. Deliver us positive. They mean the same. God does not lead us to sin against him. That is contrary to his nature. And so it makes this translation in the Queen James Bible and others hypocritical, inconsistent, disharmonious, blasphemous to God's character. God does, however, create all those other words I said, disaster, trial, testing, affliction, calamity, evil. He does lead into trial for disobedience, yes, you watch anybody who is in a state of disobedience and see their trials. But we have this from the biblical history as well, but more of that in a second. Does God actually create these? Isaiah 45 verse 7, I form the light and I create the darkness. I make peace and I create calamity. I, Yahweh, do all these things. Or I, Yahweh, I do all these things. I create calamity. Did you notice that? Yes, of course you did. So I create adversity, trial, testing. Ah, yes, that he does. Yes, because of when you do sin, so, Lord, keep us in forgiveness, keep us in obedience, and safe from enemy hostility, safe from trial, safe from adversity. And it's rooted, is it not, in forgiving and being forgiven. Forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us our offences. So we're in a state of forgiveness. As we in turn ourselves forgive those who trespass against us or forgive our debtors those who are in debt to us because they are in need of our forgiveness so we must be forgiving and we must be forgiven 
and then lead us not into adversity, calamity, but deliver us from evil, calamity, disaster. And so, um, how does God create calamity, affliction, trial, trouble, testing, etc.? Well, it was from God that Israel was taken captive into Assyria for disobedience. It was from God that the house of Judah was taken into captivity to Babylon for disobedience, refusing to listen to the prophets. It was from God that Herod's, te Herod's temple and Jerusalem were destroyed and splattered in AD 70 because after Christ's death and resurrection, they continued making sacrifices in the temple. They continued with the temple priesthood system and these were Herod's priesthood. They were not doing things in the right way because they were not men of God. And so great was the blood that was shed that Josephus, the historian, who wrote uh, describing the destruction of Jerusalem in his book, The Jewish Wars or The Wars of the Jews, he said so great was the flow of blood that it was actually quenching some of the fires um, that were set to destroy this uh, Jerusalem and the temple. That all this was from God. Well, is that fair? Well, yes, Jesus had warned to, um, to flee into the mountains, so there was plenty of warning. So punishments and disasters are from God's hand, and they are consequences of disobedience. Well, how so? Well, because if they are rebellious against God, they are weakened against threat. We see this with Israel of old, when they did not seek God when under attack, they got beaten. So they were not praying and seeking God and they were not acting in obedience. So they were not in a state of being forgiven. So this is where we must be. Surely this, is, this makes this prayer greater and greater, does it not? We must be forgiven. We must be forgiving. We must set God's name apart, and then he will feed us, and his kingdom will come, his will we will be brought to pass, and we will be delivered from affliction and adversity. But this is not where we are, is it, as a body of Christ? Because the body of Christ has accepted fake translations, fake translators, and called them the word of God. They have accepted false teachers. Now all this has been under the shade or shadow of reformed theology. So the reformers, all they did in fact was um, sack the Pope, so to speak, and create their own Pope with an archbishop and uh, write a set of their own creeds. And it was just a slight tweaking of Romish doctrine. And then passages like 2 Thessalonians 2 and the whole of Revelation, they pointed at the Vatican and said, this is all about the Vatican. Well, this is utter nonsense. I'm not trying to protect the Vatican at all, obviously. But, you know, truth is truth. 2 Thessalonians talks about going into the temple of God. So the Vatican is not the temple of God and it never became so. And the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, is not all about the Vatican. It's all about where our Lord was crucified. That's what it says. So, um, we are in a state of weakness and this is why the Christian nations of the West are under attack, it's because the body of Christ has become so weak. 
it's di a direct consequence. If our forebears had stuck with the truth and not been seduced by beasts and deceivers, then we would not be in this state here. It's just like the days of old, the house of Israel, the house of Judah, Herod's temple in Jerusalem. It's the same thing all over again. You know, the prophet Ezekiel, I love that book so much, and he talks about the idle shepherds, the false shepherds. Well, this is what we have. And all these so-called great preacher names, you look at what they actually believed. It's just reformed theology. Reformed theology is our great literary enemy. And it is reformed theology we are recovering from. So now, when we have the um, right words of the Lord's Prayer, and we have it harmonious with everything else in the Scriptures, and we understand the depth of this prayer in so few words that we all know off by heart, or well, most of us, but our, our um, learning by heart does have to be revised, so it doesn't say at the end forever and ever, it says throughout the eons. And so I read to you the Keys of the Kingdom translation, which is the organic translation. And when you have adversity and you understand that this pierasmos is adversity, affliction, and not God trying to make you sin, then how powerful, how concise, how wonderful, how divine this prayer. How mighty for these times. Do we not now, right now, need this prayer more than ever? So Jesus said that, um, spoke of his people, they'll be hated by all the nations because of his name. And we are, as uh, his people, we are being hated. We are under attack, are we not? And so we must seek God. We are in the same position as the house of Israel of old, who wouldn't listen to the prophets, the house of Judah of old, who wouldn't listen to the prophets, and got taken into captivity. This is exactly where the body of Christ is. And the body of Christ is the joint body of the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It is not Jew and Gentile, Gentile, that is deception. That is not what Ephesians chapter 2 is about. It's about the mending of the broken sticks in Ezekiel 37. I've spoken about this before. So Revelation chapter 20 talks about the, the thousand years, this millennial kingdom. And uh, I think many of us are understanding that this is not a literal thousand years. This is an ideal period because no man or woman has lived this long. And so at the end of the kingdom, there comes this short season, and it's been 200 years now. And the enemy is let loose again, not Satan. It is not some fictional monster to blame it all on. It's people. When the enemy, the false accuser, the dragon and the ancient serpent. They're all one and the same because they're listed together. So to try to distinguish one from the other will <laughs> take, um, take you down all sorts of wrong uh, rabbit holes, if you like. Um, they're listed together in Revelation 12 and Revelation 20. They're all one and the same people, the enemies of God not Satan, it's a people, and it's a people who deny that Christ is the Messiah. 1 John 4 and 2 John 7, those who deny that Christ has come in the flesh, this is the spirit of Antichrist, and spirit there put for person. This is a person of Antichrist who denies this, and then he says, 
many antichrists have gone out already into the world. There is not just one antichrist coming. The book of Revelation mentions no antichrist. It's not in there. The word is only in 1 John and 2 John. So, Revelation 20 describes this um, enemy let loose and encircling the camp of the set-apart people, or as some others have, the camp of the saints, but the set-apart people describes it better, and of the and encircling the richly loved city. Now, this is the people. City is put for people. It's nothing to do with the current Jerusalem, because that's in a state of rebellion, and they're part of the problem. They're not um, being encircled by the enemy because <laughs> they are part of the enemy. And this enemy, this adversary let loose, wants to wipe us out. And I use genocide, I've said it before, as a verb. They want to genocide us. They. We know who they are. We know many of their names even in the world news today. Deliver us from evil. Keep us in your will. Keep us in a state of forgiveness. Have mercy on us. And may we also have mercy and forgive others. Protect us. You know, they loathe us with every fibre of their being. They want to destroy us with drugs and chemtrails and food and drink and cultural Marxism and white hatred and mass migrations and movements of people to displace people and make peoples everywhere of all races feel unsettled. And they want to genocide us with wars and on our streets with no or little policing. And crime and punishment is a joke. And they wish to destroy our culture with Bolshevik degradation and degeneration of our wonderful arts of the past. You know, um, we do not have architecture and sculpture and paintings and sketches and music and literature and poetry in the ways that we used to have great works of art. Nobody produces these anymore. Uh, poetry is my particular speciality and so I've applied a lot of my poetry learning to the great epics of poetry and um, anything worth reading I've read it and so I have been working for a long time on an epic because it needs to be done and uh, we need to be trying to restore our arts to a state of greatness. We can do this if we have the application and gifting, but f frankly, more important at the moment is our proclamation of the Word of God. Now, to pray is not a state of weakness and defence. It's not weedy to say, oh, you've just got to pray. Oh yes, Christopher, yeah, we just got to pray. Yeah, that'll make a big difference. Huh. Yes. Were, were the Israelites of old not rebuked for not seeking God? And so they got beaten by the surrounding armies? Prayer is not weak and defensive. It is not a weak position. To be on our knees, on our faces, to be walking the hills walking the streets, walking the fields, praying, praying. This is not weak and defensive. This is offensive, an offence. So in Israel of old they had an army. You can read about this in the book of Numbers. Each tribe had a certain number of young men, men, trained for warfare. But it's different under the New Covenant because we're scattered and we're not all together so we cannot form an army together and pretty pathetic it would be because we could not get up the numbers. 
And so that's one reason we do not have an army. But also, we have something else. Paul says something we have that they do not have. We have, 2 Corinthians 10, what he calls the weapons of our warfare. We are not left defenseless. And he says the weapons of our warfare are not flesh-natured, but powerful through God towards smashing down strongholds, smashing down arguments, and every high thing exalting itself against the knowledge of God, and taking captive every idea into the obedience of the Christ. So not being taken captive, but us taking captive everything that sets itself against God. Ephesians 6.11 talks about the armour of God. Now he uses Roman military armour and uh, yes, the, the, the shield, the helmet, these are defensive. But the sword, that's not. And he says we should be able to hold our ground against the stratagems of the false accuser. Again, not Satan, not the devil. Let's not let them get away with it by putting it onto some mythical monster. Don't let them get away with it, with that lie. These are people and you know their names and who they are. Because, Paul says, the combat for us is not against blood and flesh, so that means we're not actually involved in hand-to-hand -hand military combat. Uh, not involved in physical warfare, this would do us no good. But we do have defensive armour and we also have the sword of the Spirit, which is the oracle or the word of God. And this is our bold proclamation and it's got to be translated right. As you will have heard me say once or twice. So the enemy encircling us, it says in Revelation 29, gets devoured by fire from the sky. Oh now, this is not literal flame, so if you're waiting around, you know, I'm reading a book by a certain Christian sect at the moment, which I was given, and it says of this sect, they do not believe in any kind of action, but they're waiting for God to set things right. Well, I agree if they, by that they mean you know, trying to become politicians and change the world, that's not going to work. But yes, we should be taking up action in prayer and proclamation, bold preaching, letting it be known what the real word of God is. We're not just sitting around, we're reclaiming our kingdom. And so just sitting around waiting for fire from the sky flames, hot flames with sparks, come to devour these people, it ain't going to happen because those that fire from the sky is the fire of the word of God. It's a figure of speech. Jeremiah twenty three twenty nine Is my word not like fire and like hammer that breaks the rock in pieces, says Yahweh. This is our word. And so um, the fire of the, the sky from God is the word out of our mouths that we are acting on. And now Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, Do you not know that the set-apart people will judge the world? Do you not know that we are going to judge messengers? So, not angels. If you haven't got Keys of the Kingdom Bible um, with messengers and you're using some other version, it's got angels, just get a big, thick black pen and cross it out. Stub it out. It should say messengers. We are not going to judge angels. There are none to be judged. But, and see, you see again how disempowering the false translation is going to judge angels. Oh, they're going to be a long line. Well, it's not going to happen. But to say that we're going to judge messengers, here, messengers, this word angelos, is just put for people, as it often is in the New Testament. 
It's not always about angels. It is used for them. Um, but it, I know it's used for John the Baptist and about women having, having their hair covered. I did a YouTube video on this. Um, and it's because of the messengers. It's the men around. So let's understand this word. It is often put for people. So we are going to judge people. Well, are we not reigning now in God's kingdom? And we are doing this very judging right now. We have the strong and powerful weapons of the sword of God, which is the correctly translated Bible, and we have prayer. We are asking God, you know, it's in Psalm 78, is it? I think it is, as um, a, a drunken man will arise from the stupor of his liquor, some such words, so may the Lord God arise from his sleep. We are asking the great military commander of the universe to come into action. Forgive us our trespasses. So that comes first. Uh, lead us not into adversity, but deliver us from evil. And we can use the prayers of the Psalms, as I've been saying over the last few weeks. And um, I'm sure you'll... Uh, many of you will remember us, particularly pointed to Psalm 5 and Psalm 83, but there are plenty of others. We can use these um, word for word, they apply. In Psalm 83, it's got the tents of Esau and the tents of Ishmael. Well, I'm sure you know who they are. And we have this wonderful prayer from the Lord Jesus in Matthew 6 and Luke 11. And we can meditate on this when we can't sleep at night and when we're stuck on a cold train station. And we can be praying these, whether out loud or whispering or in our minds, we can be going over them. So how much more did we ever in this generation need these words and need to un have them translated correctly, harmoniously? divinely, harmoniously, and to understand them, what this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, is all about. Being in a state of forgiveness with God, a state of righteousness, so that we are protected from hostilities, so that we are protected from calamities and disasters. And so every Sunday, tens of thousands up and down the country chanting these words by heart with not a thought what they mean or that temptation is blaspheming God's character. And then having chanted that, they pray for multicultural unity with these very people <laughs> who want to destroy us, having just said, deliver us from evil. But, well, there's another way of looking at it. We have this mighty prayer being prayed by hundreds of thousands, probably every day, in all these countries. So let it be with understanding. At least you now, my dear brothers and sisters, you understand it. And you probably did before you even switched this on. And so we are praying for each other and we are praying, deliver us from evil. I am praying for you daily, for strength, for revelation and understanding, for protection. And I am praying to be delivered from my enemies. And we have this simple, simple prayer, deliver us from evil. And it means calamity, disaster, hostility, all these things that might come upon us as a consequence of our disobedience because we have been seduced by reform theology for well ever since the reformation but just in these last 200 years when this um, warfare great warfare started and the enemy was let loose uh, god also raised up men and women of god and so reform theology began to be overturned and it has accelerated 
in the last 10, 20 years. Praise God. So, lead us not into calamity, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom. The kingdom is God's. It does not belong to these people. They do not belong here and they can go. Drive them away, Psalm 83. Make them like swirling dust. <laughs> How wonderful when you put all these things together. Make them like swirling dust. Drive them away. Terrify them in your tempest. It says all these things. Extraordinary. Yours is the kingdom. It is not theirs. It is God's. And it is ours because the Lord Jesus Christ has said, he said to the disciples, I assign to you a kingdom. And we have been um, transferred into the kingdom of light. Deliver us from evil. Great, isn't it? 